Good evening. I'm John Powers, and I'd like to welcome each of you to El Camino College and our presentation of 10 years after. And as you know, with this course, we look back at events from 10 years ago. And as this is the year 2015, we're looking back to the year 2005. And we're looking at three major events that we'll explore tonight. Namely, YouTube, its launch, Deep Throat, the revelation of who Deep Throat is, and the impact of Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast region. We'll begin tonight with YouTube launching. And by coincidence, today is the 10th anniversary of the first video launched on YouTube. It's a very short video. It's of one of its founders visiting the zoo and commenting on elephants that are seen behind him. It's 19 seconds long, and then it's over. we're going to see a still of that video in just a moment. But it's just a wonderful coincidence that we're presenting this course this evening on the exact 10th anniversary. And a symbol that each of you has grown to be familiar with, I'm sure, the YouTube logo. It's now a universal brand. YouTube was founded by these three individuals, Chad Hurley, Stephen Chen, and Jawed Karim, who were all early employees of PayPal. And I think you're familiar with that organization. Good. YouTube's early headquarters were situated above a pizzeria and a Japanese restaurant in San Mateo, California. They obviously had good taste in cuisine. <laughs> the domain name, YouTube.com, was activated on Valentine's Day, February 14th of that year, 2005, and a website was developed over the subsequent months. This was their first preview page. The creators offered the public a preview of this site in May, six months before YouTube made its official debut. And like many technology startups, the, before they moved into that above the restaurant scene, they actually started as an angel-funded enterprise in a, in a garage situation. In November of 2005, venture, uh, the venture capital firm Sequoia Capital invested an initial $3.5 million, and additionally, Rolf Bota, a partner in the firm and a former CEO of PayPal, joined the YouTube board of directors. Now, for those of you that experienced last year's program when we went into a lot of detail on, on Facebook, very different launch to this company versus Facebook. As you may remember, Facebook started in a dorm room with these two young men, all of it run by Zuckerberg's money and his family's money um, and money that was coming in from some uh, advertising revenue. They made a specific point not to take venture capital funding until absolutely necessary. But in this case, it was very different. In April, 2006, and this is that first video that was posted, and it is still available. This is Jawed, and he's at the zoo, standing in front of the elephants. It's 19 seconds long, and he said, wow, they've got these really long trunks. It's pretty impressive. And somebody in the background can be heard saying, yeah, and look at that goat. You know, it's early. So you can go on and see this. It's right there. Sequoia and 
Artist Capital Management put an additional $8 million into the company, which had experienced a hugely popular growth within its first few months. And according to a story that has been repeated in the media, and it's purely a PR story, Hurley and Chen developed the idea for YouTube during the early months of 2005, after they had experienced difficulty sharing videos that had been shot at a dinner party at Chen's apartment in San Francisco. Okay, the real story? They wanted to find Janet Jackson at the 2004 Super Bowl. They wanted to see that. And Karim had said that this was the inspiration and when her breast had been exposed, as you may remember, the costume malfunction during the performance. And then later, from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, they were trying to find videos of this online, and they were not easily available. And this is what was encouraging them to, hey, wouldn't it be great if there was a place where you could see the things that you really wanted to see? And this was what was going on right there. During the summer of 2006, YouTube was one of the fastest growing sites on the web, uploading more than 65,000 new videos and delivering 100 million views per day in July of that year. And it was ranked the fifth most popular website, far outpacing MySpace rate of growth. And according to Nielsen, where around 40%, the audience was about 44% female, 56% male, but the largest dominant group were of 12 to 17 year olds. But very quickly, business recognized the value of YouTube and both private individuals and large companies used it to grow their audiences. Independent content creators have built grassroots followings numbering in the thousands and I dare say the hundreds of thousands and for a few millions at very little cost or effort. While mass retail and radio promotion proved problematic. Concurrently, old early content creators, old media celebrities moved into the website at the invitation of YouTube management that witnessed early content creators accruing substantial followings and perceived audience sizes potentially larger than a, they had attained through television. And of course, that begs the question, why was this happening? Any thoughts out here? Why was this happening? It was the new Gutenberg. Observing that face-to-face -face communication of the type that online YouTube videos convey has been fine-tuned by millions of years of evolution, TED Talks curator, that is technology, education, and design curator, Chris Anderson asserted that what Gutenberg did for writing, online videos can now do for face-to-face -face communication. Now, we went through this little exercise, and some are still doing this exercise with YouTube here. Who is familiar with TED Talks, T-E-D Talks? Great. Who isn't familiar with TED Talks? Okay. One of the most valuable things on the web, TED, T-E-D, stands for Technology, Education, and Design. W wonderful uh, curated talks done by a number of, uh, promoted by a number of the advanced corporations. You can go on there and see some wonderful, uh, inspiring things. And they're all very short, by the way. I think they're limited to about 16 minutes, 16 to 17 minutes. So if nothing, I mean, you'll get a lot out of tonight, but among the things that you'll get, go home and check out TED Talks and they range on a wide assortment of subjects within those three general areas of technology, education, and design. Anderson 
asserted that it's not far-fetched to say that online videos will dramatically accelerate the scientific advancement and that video contributors may be about to launch the biggest learning cycle in human history. And there is the old Gutenberg right there, one of the actual ones in a European museum right there. YouTube was awarded in 2008 the George Foster Peabody Award for Distinguished and Meritorious Public Service. The website being described by as the speaker's corner that both embodies and promotes democracy. The Washington Post reported that a disproportionate share of YouTube's most subscribed channels feature minorities, contrasting with mainstream television in which most stars are largely white. And if you're reading today's LA Times, you see that subject is still very much with it. We're beginning to see a change whether it really changes or not, but on YouTube, you'll see the color of America really represented. And just what's going on here right now. A Pew Research Center study reported that the development of quote unquote visual journalism in which citizen eyewitnesses and established news organizations share in content creation. The study also concluded that YouTube was becoming an important platform by which people acquire news. And of course, a recent example would be the shooting of Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina. Break for a moment here. Who, I ask, who is not familiar with the recent shooting of Walter Scott? Okay, who has not checked out that video? Has, have, you, have you all seen the video of the shooting? Good, good. You know, it's on the, on the news, good, because the news picked it up right there. Um, it's also available on YouTube right there, both the, the policeman's, the uh, dash cam, as well as the subsequent right there. It's really, I feel, I mean, we're seeing our lives change as a result of ubiquitous cameras and I mean this this incident was captured by a guy who could barely hold that camera steady but when it came to the important moment that he had that camera right there and boy it changed history YouTube has enabled people also to more directly engage with their government such as the CNN YouTube presidential debate uh, in 2008, in which ordinary people submitted questions to U.S. presidential candidates via YouTube video. Describing the Arab Spring, which was begun in December of 2010, sociologist Philip N. Howard quoted an activist's succinct description that organizing the political unrest involved using Facebook to schedule the protest, Twitter to coordinate, and YouTube to tell the world. And this little video here really says a lot to us right there. No longer is that AK, but of course AK-47 machetes are still quite in use, but Twitter and Facebook are still are new tools to be using, new weapons to be used right there. Conversely, YouTube has also allowed government to more easily engage with citizens. The White House official YouTube channel being the seventh news or top news organization producer on YouTube in uh, 2012. In February of 2014, President Obama held a meeting at the White House with leading YouTube content creators to not only promote awareness of the Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, but more generally to develop ways for government to um, better connect with the YouTube generation. 
Whereas YouTube's inherent ability to allow presidents to directly connect with average citizens was noted, the YouTube content creator's new media savvy was perceived necessary to better cope with the website's distracting content and fickle audience. So it's not just the President Obama going up there and saying, hey, check this out. He needed those content creators to both draw their audience to come there and for them to be talking to their own audiences about what they were hearing. Again, Ted curator Chris Anderson described a phenomenon by which geographically distributed individuals in a certain field share independently developed skills in YouTube videos, thus challenging other people to improve their own skills and spurring invention and evolution in that field. Have any of you gone onto YouTube to say, hey, I can't figure that out. Let me see if somebody else has done it. <laughs> Who's the, okay, beautiful, beautiful. For those of you who have not used YouTube in this way, it's a, a great resource. I mean, sometimes you're going to get a 14-year-old trying to explain something to you, but other times you're going to get very experienced, very knowledgeable people telling you how to work your camera, telling you how to work your, uh, a particular software application, or many other things. So it's a great tool for learning, sharing information. The anti-bullying it gets better project expanded from a single YouTube video directed by a discouraged or directed to discouraged or suicidal LGBT teens that within two months drew video responses from hundreds, including President Obama, Vice President Biden, and White House staff, and several cabinet secretaries. Similarly, in response to 15-year-old Amanda Todd's video, My Story, Struggling, Bullying, Suicide, Self-Harm, legislative action was undertaken almost immediately after her suicide to study the prevalence of bullying and to form a national anti-bullying strategy. Well, all this is wonderful, but what's the exit strategy? Here it is. October 9th, 2006, it was announced that the company would be purchased by Google. Baby for $1.65 billion in stock. The purchase agreement between Google and YouTube came after YouTube presented three agreements with media companies in an attempt to escape the threat of copyright infringement lawsuits. Remember, one of the things that was happening, and for those of you who are early content, a lot of people were putting their favorite programs up there, you know, without getting that ad revenue that these producers and the networks were so dependent on. So they were coming after these two guys, and they said, we need to take shelter from the storm, and Google was the biggest shelter around. YouTube planned to continue operating independently with its co-founders and merely 67 employees at this time working within Google. The deal to acquire YouTube closed on November 13th and was at the time Google's second largest acquisition. Google's February 7th, 2007 Securities and Exchange Commission filing revealed that the breakdown for profits for YouTube's investors. At the time of reporting, Chad Hurley at more than $395 million, Steve Chen at more than $326 million, Jawad Karim at more than $64 million, Sequoia invested around $9 million, and they received $500 million, $16 million, and Artist Capital invested $3 million, and they received 85 million, so it was a good deal all around. Not quite like the money that Facebook realized for holding on as long as they did. And of course, Facebook today, I mean, have you, you see the uh, reporting that came out on Facebook in the last couple of days right here? Facebook has 1.44 billion people subscribed to it right now. 
So it has just really grown. And of course, their revenue is primarily coming, they, as we were talking about a year ago, they figured out the mobile app. And most of their traffic is coming off of mobile experience right there. And they're really driving a lot of revenue, ad revenue in that way. And of course, do you remember this cover on Time Magazine? In late 2006, beginning of 2007, this was a, actually a mirror, a, a glossy uh, right there. The Time Magazine featured it with a large mirror as the person of the year. The gag was, you're looking at the mirror and say, oh, I'm the person of the year putting my own stuff up out there. And it featured the site's originators along with several content creators. So it did not have quite the dramatic launch year that Facebook did. And we went through that last year. Um, of course, then they also didn't have, you know, a major motion picture telling a story about it. Um, but it was not developed out of this dorm room by two guys and going through the Hazarai that they did. And they held off from taking private money. So when they did develop that IP, when they did finally take that venture capital, they sold off so little and they took in so much. And so when that IPO hit, man, it was just huge, huge for that right there. Questions about the launch here on YouTube? Well, not the launch, but like, what is, what is it technically, how many views does it require for <laughs> you know, I, I think at one time, if you had, early on, if you had 5,000, 50,000, everybody said, oh my God, 100,000, that'd be great. Today, if you don't have in the millions, that's the, where it's, it's, it's gone. It's gone from hundreds of thousands to millions. You know, and we can just think of some of the c careers that have been launched, you know, the most prominent of young artists, of course, is Justin Bieber. He went from posting some of his music online, performing his music at home, and he developed a fan base that was just wild about him. And so when he went, uh, prof well, if you were professional, there's someone said, let's put you out on the concert series. He had a fan base that was just ready to come to him. So uh, if the... Oh, if we have cop... Oh. If the copyright issue was a strong motivation to sell to Google, what was Google's answer to defending against copyright issues? I think, you know, that Google had the ability to negotiate from a much stronger position with these media companies right there than this small outfit of these, these three uh, young men right here. Um, I, I know that those issues have been resolved. The manner in which they got resolved, I don't know. I'm sure a great deal of money exchanged hands in order to make those lawsuits go away that these uh, developers did not have. Oh, it's such a Goliath. Goliath. Goliath, yeah. It helps have Goliath on your side. You know, the, the question that we were, you know, raised here tonight, and I'll, I'll ask it here again. Who, before, I mean, we've been doing some of our own YouTube um, uh, posting right from here, but before tonight, who has, just by show of hands, who had not posted anything on YouTube? It's, had not posted anything on YouTube. Great. And now, who's posted something on YouTube? How many of those have? Beautiful. And we discovered just how easy it is, how viral that whole experience is when it just becomes easy to share these things. Any other questions that you may have on, on YouTube before we move on to another subject? Did you come across Napster at all when you were... Oh, sorry. I, I was trying to remember. The Napster got in... They didn't survive, and they were putting up movies and stuff that music. were the copyright and music, I guess. Maybe they it's another... Make, Another site I'm thinking of. No, it was Napster. It was Napster. It was Napster. Napster, of course, goes back to 2002, 2001. And what they were doing, people were sending up, using Napster to upload their recorded music, their owned music. And it was a file sharing of music. 
But what was happening is when you're, when you're borrowing somebody else's music, you're not buying music. And so the recording industry went after Napster in a huge way and brought that, you know, they just crushed them in a, in a, in a major way. Um, subsequently, we've seen a number of um, um, uh, music sharing sites develop. Uh, Spotify, Pandora, um, Apple, iTunes figured out a way of selling music, you know, so artists were coming in there. So while well, Napster was the early lead on that, um, and because it was f without cost, uh, the, st the, the music studios went after it very heavy, but subsequently um, new sites developed where there was revenue generation right there. The one thing that I will mention that came among the things that links up to um, Napster is Sean Parker, who was one of the two developers of Napster, went on, had that, went through that horrible experience, he went on to try and develop another website, was crushed. So he was instrumental in getting to um, Zuckerberg and persuading him don't let, don't take this VC money too early or they'll take your company away. The same thing that happened to me. Sean Parker was so valuable and instrumental in uh, Facebook being controlled by Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, there's a lot of people that own stock in Facebook today, but Mark Zuckerberg controls that company. And whatever entity he creates to pass on after the time of his death will control it. It will not be a core, it won't be, you know, Time Warner or, you know, or, or what, what is that? I can't think of Murdoch's. Uh, uh, News Corp. What is, what is Murdoch's corporation that News bought my, News Corp. News Corp. You know, News Corp bought MySpace and killed MySpace. Um, but Facebook is controlled by that single individual who envisioned it from the beginning. And he got great counsel by a veteran of Napster. This is just a comment um, about how technology really affected YouTube in particular. And that is that in the early days of YouTube, you could only watch very tiny videos because the resolution had to be small because the download speed was very slow. And that was a limiting factor. When you tried to take that and blow it up to a full screen you know, 19-inch CRT, it looked very grainy. And now you can upload, as in, and download, uh, basically up to high def at a fast speed because of the speed of the internet. And without it, if you think back when they first started, if they could not get to the point where they are today because of that network speed, they could not have ever had that kind of growth. Exactly, yeah. You know, there's been a, you know, a convergence of various technologies helping each other in, in this, in this, because, you know, because you, you, you know, how many people just across the world were still accessing the net by a dial-up in 2005, 2006, 2007. And, you know, we all know what that's like. So, and, you know, and then just the, the tools. The other thing that, that, that uh, YouTube did, they limited the size of the file that you could send up there. It couldn't be larger than 15 minutes. That was kind of, so you couldn't put a movie up there. That stopped that pretty quickly. You could, you could apply to be a developer and get permission to do longer things. But if you were a, a, originally coming into it, you were limited to 15 minutes. And that's why so many of the early things were short for a host of reasons and uh, to prevent movies being uploaded. Any other questions on on YouTube before we move on here to another subject right here. Oh, good. Thank you on that. Who doesn't know what Deep Throat is? Again, a show of hands. Good. Deep Throat was introduced to the public, actually not through the early articles, but through this particular book. 
The 74, all the president's men, written by Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. And according to the authors, Deep Throat was a key source of information behind the series of articles on a scandal which played a leading role in introducing the misdeeds of the Nixon administration to the general public. The scandal would eventually lead to the resignation of President Nixon, as well as prison terms for White House counsel, excuse me, White House staff, Chief of Staff, H.R. Haldeman, G. Gordon Liddy, Eagle Crow, White House counsels, Charles Colson and John Dean, presidential advisor, John Ehrlichman, and Attorney General, John Mitchell. Howard Simons, the managing editor of the Washington Post during Watergate dubbed the secret informant Deep Throat, alluding to the deep background of information and to the movie, which was the cause of so much controversy at the time. And of course, this was a hugely popular movie. This just broke box office. I mean, you know, it was also funded by mafia money. And the real reporting on this movie never was shown because that money was skimmed right out of those theaters almost after every showing. Um, the name was chosen due to the amount of publicity of the film and the ambiguity of its lacking an identifiable connection to the events. Now, for more than 30 years, the identity of Deep Throat was one of the biggest mysteries of American politics and journalism and the source of much public curiosity and speculation. Woodward and Bernstein insisted that they would not reveal the identity until he was dead. Clearly, they were not making any bones that it was a he, not a she, or consented to have his identity revealed. However, J. Anthony Lucas correctly speculated that the identity of Deep Throat was, in fact, Mark Felt in his 1976 book, Nightmare, The Underside of the Nixon Years. Lucas was widely criticized in a 1989 interview with Lucas for Playboy magazine. Bob Woodward denied that Deep Throat was part of the quote-unquote intelligence community according to an article in Slate Magazine of April 2003. And that was just Woodward playing fancy with the term. He deemed, Mark Felt was a member of the FBI, which he deemed law enforcement community, not intelligence community. So he could, he felt no guilt that he was lying. On May 31st, 2005, Vanity Fair Magazine revealed that Mark Felt was Deep Throat when it published an article, eventually appearing in its July issue, on its website first by John D. O'Connor, an attorney acting on Felt's behalf in which Felt reportedly said, I'm the guy they used to call Deep Throat. After the Vanity Fair story broke, Woodward Bernstein and Benjamin Bradley, the Post executive editor during the Watergate confirmed Felt's claim to Deep Throat. Now, just to go back, what is Watergate? Now, for most of you, I won't have to do this, but you never know. <laughs> and there it is. On June 17th, 1972, 2.30 a.m. local time, five men were arrested by police on the sixth floor of the Watergate Hotel building in Washington, D.C., inside the offices of the Democratic National Committee. There they are. James McCord, Gonzalez, Sturgis, Martinez, and Baker. Police had arrived at the scene after being alerted by Frank Wills, a security guard, who noticed that the door leading to the hotel had been taped shut. And you know, we've gone through this before, at least I know I've talked about Watergate extensively. It's such a fluke 
that they were caught in there. First of all, that these experienced intelligence people wrapped the tape horizontally where it would be visible instead of vertically so that it would be hidden when the door was closed. They put the tape on. Wills came through after just arriving on his shift. He saw it. He figured, oh, it must have been movers early in the day. He ripped it off. They came back through and said, hey, the door's locked. Of course, they had a locksmith with them who opened the door again. They retaped it in the same way. Wills comes around on a second troop, and he said, I've got trouble. He calls in to the D.C. police, and he said, I think I've got a burglary at the Watergate here. The watch commander calls out to the nearest uniformed officer. Do you know the story? Okay. Calls out to the nearest uniformed officer. Says, got to break in, go check it out. The uniformed officer, you loved it. I've got so much paperwork and I'm low on gas. <laughs> all right, all right. He puts out, will the, any officer nearby the water gate go respond to this call? The nearest car were three plainclothes policemen. They roll up to the front. I'll go back up. They roll up in a car. Look out. He's right over here looking out for cops. He says, that's nothing. And these three cops walk in, and they walk right upstairs, and they catch him right in the act. So it's just... The, you know, the flukes of history, why this whole thing went down the way it did. Look, back the other way. All right. But then, here's the, here's the good one always. What's the expression we've heard that Deep Throat was always saying? Oh, Baby, there it is. Follow the money. And they were dead. They were going to be captured right from this, right there. The situation was unusual because the five burglars had $2,300 in $100 bills in serial numbers in sequence. They also had lock picks, door jimmies, walkie-talkie, radio scanner capable of listening to police frequencies, two cameras, 40 rolls of film, tear gas guns, and sophisticated electronic devices capable of recording all conversations that might be held in the office. The reason being because of the increasing drug trafficking and the use of $100 bills as the currency of choice, federal government insisted that banks trace every serial number on $100 bills that left their office. So when the operators of this, you know, Howard Hunt, went to cash a check out of the committed to re-elect the president. He asked for $100 bills. He got, you know, paid out in $100 bills, and the bank took note of them. And that's how the feds, they just traced it right back to them. And they were going to be caught one way or another. At least one of the men was a former Central Intelligence and FBI employee, a highly decorated employee of both agencies. This person, James McCord, was at the time of his arrest a security man for Nixon's Committee to Reelect the President, also known by its acronym, CREEP. <laughs> Notebooks were found on two of the men containing the telephone numbers of E. Howard Hunt, whose name in the notebook was accompanied by the inscription W. House, or W. H., and the phone number for the White House and the scandal immediately attracted some media, some attention. A protracted period of clue searching and um, trail following then ensued with reporters and eventually the United States Senate and the judicial system probing to see how far up the executive branch of government the Watergate scandal, as it had come to be known, extended. A pair of young reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, 
wrote the coverage of the story over a period of two years. This is mentioned, this is actually numbered article number two. The first article that appeared is about this big, just a tiny little thing right there. But this one came out a little bit uh, the following day, a lot more detail in it. The scandal eventually was shown to involve a variety of legal violations and it implicated many members of the Nixon White House. Which isn't to say that there was a lot of coverage. The Post gave it the most, but it wasn't that much. Television coverage actually gave more exposure to the story than the print media did during the fall, the late summer and fall and early winter of that year. With increasing pressure from the courts and the Senate, Nixon eventually became the first president to resign, thereby avoiding impeachment by the House of Representatives and removal from the office of the United States Senate. Woodward and Bernstein's stories contained information that was remarkably similar to information uncovered by FBI investigators. And this was a journalistic advantage not enjoyed by any other journalist at the time. Now, Woodward had befriended Mark Felt years, years earlier and had consulted with him on stories before the Watergate scandal. And in public statements following the disclosure of his identity, Felt's family called him an American hero, stating that he leaked information about the Watergate scandal um, to the Washington Post for moral and patriotic reasons. Other commentators, however, have speculated that Felt may have had more personal reasons for leaking information to Woodward. In his book, The Secret Man, Woodward describes Felt as a loyalist and admirer of J. Edgar Hoover. And I'd point out, Watergate went down the break-in went down in June of 71. Hoover died in May of 71. Now, Hoover was willing to break the law, whatever his president wanted him to do, so long as it did not embarrass the FBI. He was the only one of the intelligence community who refused to carry out G. Gordon Liddy's earlier gemstone program, which was a, 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 a menu of, of law breaking that he had proposed. And, and the one who basically put a stop to that early on was Hoover. Not because he objected to breaking the law, but he was, he did not want, he was afraid of being found out and he did not want to embarrass the FBI. So Hoover dies in May and this whole caper begins in June. However, after Hoover's death, Felt became angry. Felt was number three in the agency at this time. He was angry and disgusted when L. Patrick Gray, a career naval officer and lawyer from the Civil Division of the Justice Department with no prior law enforcement experience, was appointed director of the FBI over Felt a 30-year veteran of the Bureau. Felt was particularly unhappy with Gray's management style of the FBI, which was markedly different from Hoover's. Felt selected Woodward and Bernstein because he knew they were assigned to investigate the burglary for the post, and instead of seeking out prosecutors, at the Justice Department or the Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, charged with investigating presidential wrongdoing, he methodically leaked information to Woodward and Bernstein to guide their investigation <coughs> and keep his own identity and involvement secretly concealed. Although confirmation of 
Deep Throat's identity remained elusive for 30 years, there were suspicions that felt was indeed the reporter's elusive source long before the public acknowledgement of it in 2005. Again, another author here. In Leak, Why Mark Felt Became Deep Throat, Max Holland reported that Felt had leaked actually to two major sources, Washington Post <coughs> and Time Magazine. Now here's a curious little detail. While the Post did not reveal its source, Time Magazine correspondent Sandy Smith told Time's lawyer, Kravis Swain and Moore partner Roswell Gilpatrick, who told Assistant General Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice Criminal Division, Harry Peterson, who revealed it to the White House counsel, John Dean, who reported it to President Nixon. Call it the daisy chain. Nixon's stated rationale, oh, I should back up, and Nick, but Nixon, however, did not out felt for the, what am I saying here? The Nixon White House knew from the get-go, Mark Felt was revealing all this information. They never should have known, but you see what happens. People in administration love to help one another out. FBI over here never should have been talking to the, the people that were being investigated, but he was going almost on a daily basis coming in and telling him what his investigators were finding out. Dean, along with the rest of the uh, White House advisors, were then getting together on a daily basis trying to figure out what the story should be. And this is what went on for months. Nixon stated rationale that this, that for this, that had he done this, felt would have publicly revealed information damaging to the FBI and to other powerful people and institutions. Nixon at the time felt, stated Felt knows everything there is to know in the FBI and Nixon's motives for not, for Nixon's motives in not outing Felt may not have been entirely altruistic, however, since Nixon would have been damaged by Felt's potential revelations. On June 2nd, 2005, the Washington Post ran a lengthy front page story by Woodward in which he detailed his friendship with Felt in the years before Watergate. And Woodward wrote that he first met Felt by chance in 1970 when Woodward was a Navy lieutenant in his mid-20s who was dispatched to deliver a package at the White House. And Felt arrived soon after for a separate appointment. And he sat next to Woodward in the waiting room and Woodward struck up a conversation with him, eventually learning of Felt's position in the upper echelon of the FBI. Woodward, who was about to get out of the Navy at the time and was unsure about his future direction in life, became determined to use Felt as a mentor and a career advisor, and he got Felt's phone number and he kept in touch with him. After deciding to try a career as a reporter and Woodward first came on the paper, not as a you know, major investigator. He was doing restaurant closures and really low-end stuff. The Washington Post in August of 71 felt who Woodward writes had long ago had a dim view of the Nixon administration, began passing information to Woodward, although he insisted that Woodward keep the FBI and the Justice Department out of anything he wrote based on that information. The first time Woodward um, used information from Felt in a Washington Post story was in mid-May of 72, a month before Watergate, when Woodward was reporting on the man who had attempted to assassinate presidential candidate George C. Wallace. Nixon had put Felt in charge of that investigation of the would-be assassin. 
A month later, just days after the Watergate break-in, Woodward would call Felt at his office, making the first time Woodward spoke with Felt about Watergate. Commenting on Felt's motivations for serving as his deep throat source, Woodward wrote, Felt believed he was protecting the Bureau by finding a way, clandestine as it was, to push some of the information from the FBI interviews out to the public, to help build public and political pressure to make Nixon and his people answerable. He had nothing but contempt for the Nixon White House and their efforts to manipulate the Bureau for political reasons. In 1980, Felt himself was convicted of ordering an illegal break-in at the homes of weathermen suspects and their families. Richard Nixon testified on his behalf and President Ronald Reagan pardoned Felt and his conviction was subsequently expunged from the record. So I guess there are convicts and there are convicts. And I love this last image which I throw in. Jimmy Cagney, amid chorus girls in the 1930s right here. And this is, I view this really as Woodward amid all these people. They are as thick as thieves back there in D.C. And uh, one is serving, one hand washes another. Um, at any rate. You know, and, you know, Woodward, you know, the Mark Felton is saying, I was so disgusted with the Nixon administration. Felt was a deep admirer of Nixon until he appointed Gray over him. And then it all got flipped. And then he went after Nixon with a vengeance. Questions? Oh, wait, we have a microphone coming up here. Do you remember those good times? <laughs> How much did the Watergate tapes reveal about Nixon's knowledge of Felt's co impact in this. Re repeat the question again. Uh, in, the, in the Nixon tapes. The tapes. The tapes, right. Was Felt mentioned in the tapes? You know, that Nixon, if Nixon knew about Felt uh, being a, uh, how to deal with him, was that, is, do, the, do the tapes in, indicate Felt's involvement in the? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure he mentions him in the tapes. I don't know. Um, I, I, I can't answer that question directly by there. Um, but if he did, they definitely would be on the tapes, and they're all out there in your Belinda. You know, for, and, you know, there, and, you know, recently, John Dean, who now, it feels like about four years ago, you know, when he had a, a recent book that he was doing, he was at the Torrance Library, he wasn't complete with the book that he was doing, but he was going out to the Nixon Library on a daily basis with his own stenographer listening to the tapes. And he said that the early transcript that was done at, in 73 when the tapes were first revealed were so poorly done. A lot of it is garbled or poorly, poorly recorded. But listening closely with his own stenographer, he really picked up a lot of things and it comprised that book that he published, I would say, now in 2012, right in there, 2012, 2011. So there's a tremendous amount of information. As I said, each one of you can go out to the library and listen to those tapes. You just go in, say, I'd like to listen to the tapes. You know, which ones do you want to listen to? And they'll set you up, earphones, and they'll bring the tape out to you with a recorder. It's your history part of the National Archives, one of the greatest institutions of our nation. Any other questions here on, okay, we'll start right here. What was the real, what was the real uh, long-lasting impact on America after the Watergate revolution, uh, revelations? Was there that much shock and outrage? As I try to remember that period, uh, I don't recall my colleagues having been that outraged, uh, except for one thing. Uh, these idiots got caught, you know, and, and in a way, this whole episode brought us closer to coming of age. This is what goes on all the time. Well, I think it was disgust. Well, yeah, but they got caught. 
It's not that we do these things, that the these idiots got caught. Well, I don't really think so. No. I never saw that amount of outrage because we all knew in our own little beady minds that this is how it's all done everywhere. Institutional church, academe. This is how we do it. It's about time we grow up because everybody else has done it. Europeans laughed at us. Another question. This is a silly question. What was the $2,300 for? Why did they have money? I don't get that. Like, I understand all the technical stuff that they brought in, the recording devices and the stuff that they were going to bug. What, what did they need the cash for? That's my question. <laughs> this was their payment for breaking and entering. They were being paid in cash. Um, the the simple explanation is, is right there. This was their this was their, so they, their were, they were paid before they went in, absolutely. and they had the money on them that they they had money them. on them, and there was more money because you know I I showed that image of the Watergate right there. They had a lookout in the Howard Johnsons directly across the streets, with eyes on the office building and on the entryway down below so they could see if anything was going to happen. But E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy were in a separate hotel room in the Watergate complex, and that was Command Central. And the walkie-talkies were, this was a, a triangular situation. Command Central, the lookout, and then the operatives going up over here. Mm -hmm. And there was more money found in the hotel room as well. And then a, an envelope with E. Howard Hunt's paycheck in it to pay his dues at his country club. And the FBI showed up at his door saying, this is yours? Well, guess where we found it? You know, there's a lot of little detail. The deta that's why I say, I thought you've heard me always say this. The details of history are so fascinating because they reveal um, the, the, the frailty of, of human experience. And the 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 the, the, uh, the vanity and the, the, the but anyway there was the and so just going back here a second one of the why, why I said the money was going to doom them from the beginning because when they found out that they were found with the cash on them one of the people in the creeps headquarters they knew that that money was paid out at a bank and that money was paid with a check from the Republican, real, the committee to reelect the president. So that money came out of an account from the reelection committee. So they're going to go in, the FBI is going to, it's going to follow that money, and they're going to see, well, where did that money, it, how did that money get into the account that they could write a check out of? Mm -hmm. um, and that began this whole other expect You've heard about the the, a major donation that was made from Texans and Mexican banks. That's another part of the story that precedes this. We won't get into it tonight. But once an assistant treasurer for the campaign heard that they had these sequenced $100 bills and they said, do you think they're going to find us? He said, yeah. And he said, well, would you lie and say that they came from something else? The one person... He said, no, I won't do it. He's the only one in that whole organization said, I won't lie. So they had to find somebody else. They pulled somebody else from the campaign, and they made up this big story about how G. Gordon Liddy was using this money for you know, security protection of you know, uh, campaign events. Oh, it was all bull. They began the lie right at the beginning. I, I, I just want to say to this man's point that I disagree with you that I think people were shocked um, because like today, you know, the media jumps on every story and we get so deluged with the media's perspective on something that, you know, we kind of buy into whatever the media feeds us. Um, but back then, I don't think it was quite as, the media didn't jump on things quite that hysterically as they do today. And at, at, up to that point, I was pretty young and I, up to that point, I don't think I had ever heard of such a a thing by the President of the United States. So that was pretty shocking, I think. So. I'll come back. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come over and just say, 
I really don't think we're that much in disagreement because you just admitted you were pretty green when you, you know, heard about all this stuff. Right. Yeah, but this is what how any society our age operates. You know, there are no more virgins left. Come on. I have to make a comment on Watergate itself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I was in Washington, D.C. for a month at the mm -hmm. Library of Congress that I began to realize uh, what, or really comprehend what some of my colleagues have been saying, uh, colleagues in architecture. They're saying, God, you know, there couldn't have been a more appropriate scenario for all this sordid stuff going on because the Watergate itself is a flaccid, sagging, ugly <laughs> piece of architecture <laughs> that only the nouveau riche would hang out there. And true enough, during the month uh, I was at uh, the Library of Congress, I lived in a, uh, in a dorm uh, two blocks away. Nobody here, I imagine, has been to the, to the supermarket inside the Watergate. It's a dingy little Safeway. And you'll meet Martha Mitchell. I bumped into Martha Mitchell one morning. She's a drunken slob. And she was in her little pink ostrich feather uh, uh, house coat and uh, still drunk and looking for cherries. Uh, and then you walk to the halls. It, looked, it was like something out of a Fellini movie. You know, La Dolce Vita. All these hideous, hideous caricatures of America just gone absolutely down the drain. Watergate seems to stir the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to get him to investigate how El Camino was really run. <laughs> so, um, a comment and a question. So, uh, it's interesting how you describe that one part of the FBI or Justice Department is talking to some of the defendants, meaning the White House, while the other part of the FBI is running or doing some sort of investigation. He's running the investigation. And, and leaking Im information sideways to the press. So the question is, although you had, had mentioned how Felt was turned around in terms of once admiring Nixon and now quite, quite against him, since the FBI was running their investigation, you know, why not wait for the investigation to run through as compared to simultaneously leaking information to the press? I, I remember the part that you said about getting a public sentiment. So it sounds like, if, if that was the main reason, that he's running an investigation, trying to drum up evidence, and trying to drum up public support? Is that what it was? I'm not sure. Well, hold on. He, the investigators who were on the case had to turn in their information to their higher-ups. And eventually it landed on Harry Peterson's desk. And it was Harry Peterson under orders um, from Gray to carry that information over to the White House and let the White House know what we found on you. Eventually what happened is that the people working on the case realized this was going on and they stopped sending the information they just, you know, they disobeyed, and they stopped sending the information forward. Felt was stirring the pot in this whole issue right here to get things going. He had an axe to grind. Um, you know, we, you know, I think we all, looking back on him, when all the presidents and we think, man, what a great guy. But he had a personal, he was angry at Nixon for putting Gray over him, and he was going to get back. And remember, Gray took a big fall himself because, remember, Gray destroyed information. They went and pulled information. You know, they went to E. Howard Hunt's safe in the White House, had um, Secret Service drill that safe open, and they removed those items. John Dean, L. Patrick Gray are right there. And with John Ehrlichman, they all said, boy, this is hot stuff. What are we going to do with it? And they gave it to Gray, and eventually they told Gray, you've got to get rid of it. And Gray threw it in the, the river. And that came up. Now, none of this had come up initially, but it came up later when Gray was trying, because Gray was, the, uh, he was a, 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 a temporary appointee, and he was now trying to get Senate confirmation. And before the Senate, in this hot environment, 
he didn't answer those questions so well. Or perhaps I said, should say he answered those questions too well. He revealed all that he had done under orders, and that sunk his chances of ever becoming uh, FBI director right then. In 72, I was just slightly younger than you. I was a junior in high school, and I was an exchange student in the Mideast without a TV. But we did have newspapers, like it was in Israel. I had the Jerusalem Post um, and Newsweek, but not Time, which is interesting. And I, I remember all of us talking about what was going on, and when the election happened, I couldn't believe people were even going to vote again for, for Nixon. And I remember writing my folks a note who got Time magazine, not Newsweek. So I copied a lot of the things that the Newsweek articles had said and the Jerusalem Post said that I couldn't believe that they were even thinking of even voting for Nixon with all of this going on. But as high school kids who were so idealistic, we just couldn't believe it. We just couldn't believe it. But I think my parents were more like, well, this is, this is awful. This is horrible. This is disgusting. But this is politics. Well, then. I would be interested to know how my folks voted, because I don't know how they voted. <laughs> <laughs> and, can, and, can, and who can remember the results of the 72 election? Right. <laughs> Nixon won. Oh, he didn't just win. Landslide. Yeah. Landslide. Yeah. Landslide. Landslide was crushed McGovern, you know. Yes. Was, and he never needed to, none of this he never needed. But you have to go into Nixon's, you know, pathology, really, to say, why did he do this? It really goes back much, much earlier, and it's just his way of operating. Any other questions here on, on Watergate? All right. Hurricane Katrina. Was the costliest national disaster, as well as one of the five deadliest hurricanes in the history of the United States. The storm is currently ranked as the third most intense in the United States, landfalling, a landfalling uh, tropical cyclone. Behind only the 1935 Labor Day hurricane and Hurricane Camille in 1969. Overall, at least 1,800, more than 1,800 people died in the hurricane and the subsequent flooding, making it the deadliest hurricane since the 1928 Okeechobee hurricane. Total property damage was estimated at $108 billion, roughly four times the damage of Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Katrina originated over the Bahamas on August 23rd from an interaction between a tropical wave and the remnants of a tropical depression. Early the following day, the new depression intensified into a tropical storm, Katrina. The cyclone headed generally westward toward Florida and strengthened into a hurricane only two hours before making landfall on August 25th. Landfall of, of course, Florida. After very briefly weakening to a tropical storm, Katrina emerged into the Gulf of Mexico on August 26th and began to rapidly build. The storm strengthened to a Category 5 hurricane over the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico but weakened before making its second landfall as a Category 3 hurricane on August 29th in southeast Louisiana. Katrina caused severe destruction along the entire Gulf Coast from central Florida to Texas, much of it due to a storm surge. The most significant number of deaths occurred in New Orleans which flooded as the levee system catastrophically failed. And in many cases, hours 
after the storm had moved inland. Eventually, 80% of the city and large tracts of neighboring parishes became flooded and the floodwaters lingered for weeks. However, the worst property damage occurred in coastal areas such as Mississippi beachfront towns and where over 90% of these were flooded. The hurricane surge protection failure in New Orleans, however, is considered the worst engineering disaster in U.S. history and prompted a lawsuit against the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the designers and builders of the levee system as mandated by the Flood Control Act of 3065. Essentially what this, I know it isn't in great, uh, um, too much detail here, but essentially what you see happening, the waters, this is the existing I-beam uh, structure that they have. The waters build up on this side and then they top and they go over and they undermine the opposite side of the wall, loosening the support or the limited support that it had there and that wall just came down. There was also an investigation of the responses of the federal, state, and local governments resulting in the resignation of FEMA Director Michael D. Brown, that's the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and of the New Orleans Police Department Superintendent Eddie Compass, and many other government officials were criticized for their responses, especially New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin and uh, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco and President George Bush. However, several agencies, including the U.S. Coast Guard, National Hurricane Center, and National Weather Service were commended for their actions. They provided accurate hurricane weather tracking forecasts with sufficient lead time. On the afternoon of August 26th, the National Hurricane Center predicted the track of the storm from the Florida Panhandle to the Mississippi coast. The National Weather Service's New Orleans Baton Rouge office issued a vividly worded bulletin on August 28th, predicting that the area would be quote unquote uninhabitable for weeks after devastating damage caused by Katrina, which at the time rivaled the intensity of Hurricane Camille. During video conferences involving the president later that day, National Hurricane Center Director Max Mayfield expressed concern that Katrina might push its storm surge over the city's levees and flood walls. In one conference, he stated, quote, I do not think anyone can tell you with confidence right now whether the levees will be topped or not, but that's obviously a very, very great concern. On August 27th, President George Bush declared a state of emergency in selected regions of Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. Voluntary and mandatory evacuations were issued for large areas of southeast Louisiana, as well as coastal Mississippi and Alabama. About 1.2 million residents of the Gulf Coast were covered under a voluntary or mandatory evacuation order. By Sunday, August 28th, most infrastructure along the coast had been shut down, including the freight and Amtrak rail traffic into the evacuation areas, as well as the Waterford nuclear generating station, thank goodness. At a news conference at 10 a.m. on August 26, shortly after Katrina was upgraded to a Category 5, New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin ordered the first ever mandatory evacuation of the city, calling Katrina's storm that most the storm that most of us have long feared. The city government also established several refuges of last resort for citizens who could not leave the city, including the massive Louisiana Superdome, which sheltered approximately 26,000 people and provided them with food and water for several days as the storm came ashore. Some estimates claim that 80% of the one point 2 million residents of the greater New Orleans metropolitan area evacuated, leaving behind substantially fewer people than remained in the city after Hurricane Ivan evacuation. And now the storm hits. 
On August 29th, Katrina hit. Its storm surge caused 53 different levee breaches in greater New Orleans, submerging 80% of the city. All within a matter of minutes. Levee breaches in New Orleans also caused a significant number of deaths. More than 700 bodies recovered in New Orleans by October 23rd. These were during the whole length of time of the recovery. Some survivors and evacuees reported seeing dead bodies lying in the streets and floating in still flooded sections, especially in the east of the city. The first deaths reported by the city were reported shortly before midnight on August 28th as three nursing home patients died during an evacuation to Baton Rouge, most likely from dehydration. While there were also early reports of fatalities amid mayhem at the Superdome, only six deaths were confirmed there, with four of these originating from natural causes, one from a drug overdose and one a suicide. At the convention center, four bodies were recovered. One of the four is believed to be the result of a homicide. There is also evidence that many prisoners were abandoned in their cells during the storm while the guards sought shelter. Hundreds of prisoners were later registered as unaccounted for. Shortly after the uh, hurricane moved on August 30th, some residents of New Orleans who remained in the city began looting stores. Many were in search of food and water that were not available to them through any other means, as well as non-essential items. Additionally, there were reports of carjackings, murders, thefts, and rapes in New Orleans. Some sources later determined that many of these reports were inaccurate, greatly exaggerated, or completely false, leading news agencies to reprint retractions. Wasn't Brian Williams there? <laughs> The Gulf Coast of Mississippi suffered massive damage from the impact of Hurricane Katrina on August 29th, leaving 238 people dead, 67 missing, and billions of dollars of damage in bridges, barges, boats, piers, houses, and cars were all washed inland. Katrina traveled up the entire state of Mississippi and afterwards all 62, 82 counties were declared disaster areas by federal assistance, 47 of them for full assistance. The economic impacts of the storm were far reaching. Homes destroyed, almost looks like a comic book on that one, the way that was crushed there. Homes were abandoned. Neighborhoods flooded and communities submerged. The Bush administration sought $105 billion for repairs and reconstruction in the region, which did not account for damage to the economy caused by the potential interruption of oil supply, destruction of the Gulf Coast highway infrastructure, and exports of commodities such as grain. Katrina damaged or destroyed 30 oil platforms and caused closure of nine refineries. The total shut in oil production from Gulf of Mexico in the six month period following Katrina was approximately 24% of the annual production. And the shut in gas production for the same period was about 18%. The storm caused spills from 44 facilities throughout southeastern Louisiana and resulted in 
more than 7 million U.S. gallons of oil being leaked. The forestry industry of Mississippi was also affected as 1.3 million acres of forest lands were destroyed. The total loss of the forestry industry from Katrina is calculated to rise about $5 billion. Furthermore, hundreds of thousands of local residents were left unemployed. Before the region, before the hurricane, the region supported approximately 1 million non-farm jobs, with 600,000 of them in New Orleans. Katrina displaced over 1 million people from the central Gulf Coast to elsewhere in the United States, becoming the largest diaspora in the U.S. history. Houston, Texas had an increase of 35,000 people. Mobile, Alabama gained 24,000. Baton Rouge, 15,000. Hammond, Louisiana received over 10,000, nearly doubling its size. And Chicago received more than 6,000 people, the most of any non-Southern city. By late January 2006, about 200,000 people were once again living in New Orleans, less than half the pre-storm population. By July 1, 2006, when new population estimates were calculated by the U.S. Census Bureau, the state of Louisiana showed a population decline of 220,000 people, or about 5% statewide. Katrina had also a profound impact on the environment. The storm surge caused subsequent substantial beach erosion, in some cases completely devastating coastal areas. Breeding grounds were lost. You know, got to have a little humor. Huh? Okay, breeding grounds are lost. The lands that were lost were breeding grounds for marine mammals, brown pelicans, turtles, and fish, as well as migratory species such as the redhead ducks. Overall, about 20% of the local marshes were permanently overrun by water as a result of the storm. The damage from Katrina forced the closure of 16 national wildlife refuges. Breton National Wildlife Refuge lost half its area in the storm. As a result, the hurricane affected the habitats of sea turtles, Mississippi hand sandhill cranes, and the Alabama beach mice. Finally, as part of the cleanup effort, the floodwaters that covered New Orleans were pumped into Lake Pontchartrain, a process that took 43 days. These residual waters contain a mix of raw sewage, bacteria, heavy metals, pesticides, toxic chemicals, and oil, which sparked fears of a scientific community, in the scientific community, of a massive numbers of fish dying. And now the aftermath of all that destruction. Within days of Katrina's August 29th landfall, public debate arose about the local, state, federal, government's role in the preparation for and the public response to the hurricane. Criticism was initially prompted by television images of visibly shaken and frustrated political leaders and of residents who remained stranded by floodwaters without water, food, or shelter. Many televised images were captured by citizen journalists and posted on YouTube. Deaths from thirst, exhaustion, and violence days after the storm had passed fueled the criticism, as did the dilemma of the evacuees at facilities such as the Louisiana Superdome and the New Orleans Civic Center. <clears throat> Some allege that race, clash, class, and other factors could have contributed to delays in government response. For example, during a concert for Hurricane Relief, a concert benefit for the victims of the hurricane, rapper Kanye West veered off course, which we've learned is par for the course for Kanye, <laughs> stated that uh, George Bush doesn't care about black people. In accordance with federal law, President George Bush directed Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, 
to coordinate the federal response. Chertoff designated Michael D. Brown, head of the FEMA, as the principal federal official to lead the deployment and coordination of all federal response resources and forces in the Gulf region. Eight days later, Brown was recalled to Washington and Coast Guard Vice Admiral Thad Allen replaced him as the chief of hurricane relief operations. Three days after the recall, Michael Brown resigned as director of FEMA in spite of having received recent praise from President Bush. The destruction wrought by Hurricane Katrina raised other more general public policy questions about emergency management, environmental policy, poverty, and unemployment. The discussion both the, both the immediate response and the broader public policy issues may have affected elections and legislation enacted at various levels of government. The storm's devastation also prompted congressional investigation, which found that FEMA and the Red Cross, quote, did not have a logistics capacity sophisticated enough to fully support the massive number of Gulf Coast victims. Additionally, it placed responsibility for the disaster on all three levels of government, local, state, federal. A June 2007 report released by the American Society of Civil Engineers states that the failures of the locally built and federally funded le levies in New Orleans were found to be primarily the result of system design flaws. I'm not sure that helps that gentleman right there. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who by federal mandate is responsible for conception, design, and construction of the region's flood control system, failed to pay sufficient attention to public safety. On April 5, 2006, nine months after independent investigators had demonstrated that levy failures were not caused by natural forces beyond intended design, Lieutenant General Carl Strzok, Chief of Engineers and Commander of the Corps of Engineers, testified before the United States Senate Subcommittee on Energy and Water that, quote, we have now concluded we had problems with the design of the structure. He also testified that the Army Corps of Engineers did not know of this mechanism of failure prior to August 29th, 2005. The claim of ignorance, however, is refuted by the National Science Foundation investigators hired by the Corps of Engineers who point to a 1986 study by the Corps itself that such separations were possible by the eye wall design that was detailed earlier. Now, the levees have been reconstructed with a new design, and many of these have been reconstructed since the Katrina. And in reconstructing them, precautions were taken to bring the levees up to modern building code standards and to ensure their safety. And a new generation of residents of New Orleans hope that they hold should a storm of this level comes before them again. Questions about Katrina? Yeah, the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagan, was he prosecuted for skimming money off the, what was coming from FEMA? Is I know he was recently prosecuted and found guilty. The specifics of the charges uh, that he uh, was guilty of, I can't speak to. How high do you build the wall? <laughs> well, I think the height of the wall was sufficient. If water goes over it, it goes over it. The problem was when they break and they fall down, then there's just this massive breach in which water can flood through. It's very different if water's just topping over it. That's a relatively minimal amount of water. When you have a breach like this, or the one before it right there, that's 
you can you, just see. It's, you have a monstrous storm there. <laughs> and, and it's not the, it, the storm has actually passed. It's the, the flood, the water that has just been brought, pushed in has just, is just coming into that, that lower, I mean, the ninth ward right there, was just, which is below sea level, just filled completely. Any, anyone else? You know, there are a lot of uh, questions as to whether there should even be uh, investment of public funds to rebuild a situation that is unnatural to begin with. And you add in global warning, uh, warming and all the predictions of uh, seawater uh, rising, uh, inundating places like this. Uh, so that's a big question. I empathize in a way with the public officials. Mm -hmm. uh, nostalgia, New Orleans, the cultural past, and mm -hmm. all that garbage that they've been throwing around uh, won the day. Mm -hmm. But really, this is an untenable situation. So I have one, one real question is to have, adequately, to have adequately prepared for what transpired when that massive, massive hurricane hit it would be almost impossible for a city official because the taxpayers would not buy what's required to prepare for it. I know this because I was, I served as a guardian of city councilman, very low level, but people will not sure. support preparedness. And so I translate that, transpose it onto our local area. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know the big one's coming. They keep telling us that. Mm -hmm. There's been a, a spate of, of warnings again and daily breeze. For someone to blame. Yeah, and are we prepared for uh, what's really going to hit the big one? I don't think so. I took a CERT, a community emergency response team uh, course, and we were told by you know, the local police and fire, prepare for a minimum of two weeks without any outside assistance. Everything's going to go down. So what do we learn from this? I don't know. It is the first of its kind. It's um, something that has never been faced before and, and um, probably couldn't have been imagined. And we haven't learned anything from it. <laughs> 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 what have we learned? We haven't learned anything from it. Because the point that he just made we had, in our local community, we had this woman that came through with this Red Cross trained and everything, and she said, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. We all wrote it down. We didn't do anything about it. <laughs> I mean, it's just the reality of these things happening. Uh, it's like, like a teenager driving for the first time. He can drive forever, never get hurt. It's the same mentality. Anyone else? Yeah. I, I think that all three of these topics have one thing in common. Uh, this is not the only thing, but it occurred to me that this helps to uh, help, helps us mature as a nation. It, it should help us to realize that mythology like American exceptionalism cannot be accepted as a reality of the world we live in because all these events were exceptional and proved that we were not exceptionally up to the task. And so we'd better start dealing with a more realistic appraisal of the world we live in. Okay, so you, you said over here it's the first time these things happen and I would go one step further and say that they all changed culture slightly. Not just, just happened, but they also changed our culture. So YouTube for sure changed our culture in the way we, we interact with one another through the through social media. Um, the uh, deep throat, I don't know if the revelation of that information changed our culture, but the incident of the Watergate scandal changed our culture at that time. And I think that, to me, was something I alluded to earlier about media. I think, to me, that was like the birth of media hysteria. It's like media became in control of what we hear and believe today. 
everything comes from the media, not from our own investigation or our own sources of knowledge. It's whatever the media feeds us. And I think, to me, that's kind of when that all started happening. And then the third thing with Katrina, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it changed our culture, except that it shocked us so much that we maybe became more aware of what we really need to do as a nation mm -hmm. when it comes to emergencies, but mm -hmm. I can't really say. Mm -hmm. I think your point on the media. I think your point on the media is great, because there was a tremendous impact on the public as a result of the media coverage, and and YouTube sort of has become the new media. <laughs> you know, I know when when I was seeing those images from uh, New Orleans show up there, it was shocking that where's 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 the cavalry? And, and there wasn't. And, and, it, and what a lesson that was. We're on our own. And it was the determination of a few individuals until forces could be grouped in there. But of course, you know, there were other factors to play. FEMA had been, been gradually uh, um, uh, Undefunded over the, the structure of FEMA had been shrunk over a number of years um, from what it had been. So it was a much smaller organization. It didn't have the capacity to respond to such a huge thing like this. We had huge floods in the 30s on the Mississippi River, <coughs> tremendous amounts of damage. But we had a daily newspaper and a radio news broadcast. And a few days it was over. Life magazine had some pictures of it. And uh, they began to build dams on the Missouri River and the Mississippi River. You but it, it wasn't, yes, it wasn't covered like this. And it didn't, inv it didn't involve the government and scandals and that kind of thing. The people were surviving on their own. They didn't look to anyone else to rescue them, really. Anyone else? I've been making mainly uh, <laughs> negative comments all evening. Uh, I'd hate to end it that way. And I think that <laughs> one of the things that comes out, a positive uh, thing that comes out of a session like this is that we are discussing the truth. Instead of, again, uh, believing in all this mythology that does not prepare us for anything real. And that's, I think, what we have to do as a, as a nation. Mm -hmm. Thank God we're getting rid of all the exceptionalism that has served mm -hmm. as a cover story. Mm -hmm. And maybe this will force us to realize that we've got to have our students study harder, uh, aim the bar higher in every one of the activities that comprises human life, mm -hmm. whether it be doctors or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we have not been, able, not been doing that. We have not been demanding that kind of realistic assessment of what it takes to survive, let alone prevail or excel. So this is what history ought to be about. And you're an excellent historian, John, as opposed to so many PhDs with fancy titles like professor who are out there simply spouting mythology. And you know, and marketing majors out there validating lies, you know, working for tobacco companies. It's just absolutely revolting, but these kinds of events force us to realize that there is so much bullshit out there that we've got to Call it as we see it, mm -hmm. and get on with reality. Mm -hmm. So thank you for adding to that search for the truth, John. You, will, you know, it's, it's, for, for me, it's been really disconcerting, you know, to, to, you know, we live in L.A., so we're a long way from D.C. To hear the conversation, to read about the conversation going back in D.C., and it's, granted, there are a number of elected officials and um, appointed officials and people within agencies that are very concerned about climate change. The discussion going among elected officials or a host of elected officials is an avoidance of this. And we're passing on a huge issue to children and grandchildren. And does that's really disconcerting, you know, it's just disconcerting to say the least. And we certainly would, one would wish that there would be a much more sober um, uh, action by elected officials 
on these key issues, on this key issue that's, and what needs to be done and things that need to be done. And for what, I guess on one hand, we're, we're looking at it as Californians, particularly Southern Californians, we're getting a glimpse of it by dealing with our drought right now and the mandates coming down from the governor's office at last to say, let's take this seriously. And it's a, a, a recognition of, of what the effect is going on. Any other comments that anyone would like to make? Or I want to thank each of you who joined in and did the YouTube thing for us. I will say this to our, our audience that may be out there listening to it. We had a number of people who never posted on YouTube. And before we began tonight, had them do some recording and do some posting with their phones here tonight. So we had a breakthrough on that. Excellent. That's what it's about, to learn, and to, to learn from one another. Um, we have, if you will take a moment, there are um, some responses that uh, El Camino College would like you to fill out just how you felt about this the experience tonight. If you take a moment to fill that out, I'd appreciate it. And then take a moment just to chat with one another informally here. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I know we have a, several new people with us here tonight, but it's an enjoyable experience to be with you. And thank you again for your support. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>